Buenos días, los amigos y amigas que alegría que estemos todos juntos aquí en la iglesia de todos los santos. Welcome, friends. What a joy it is for us all to be together here at All Saints Church. Mi nombre es Mike Kenman. My name is Mike Kenman, soy rector. Uh, I am the rector. Mi pronombre es él. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, it is the first Sunday of Advent, and we are thrilled to, in just a moment, uh, welcome the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney. Uh, to talk about the women's lectionary that we are going to be using starting today and for the rest of this year. Want to give you a couple updates uh, before we get to Dr. Gaffney. The first is um, at our Sunday food table today, we gave out 72 meals from Hope Kitchen and 75 masks, as well as some other items that were generously donated by Alma Stokes. And so thank you to Alma, thank you to Erica, Corey, Gail, and Bob, and everyone who was out uh, safely at All Saints Church this morning, uh, helping out with the food table. When uh, this pandemic started, we began to support some of the local organizations which with, with which we have strong ties uh, as what we called our partners in love because we wanted to ensure that their good work continued during these challenging times. One such partner has been Learning Works Charter School and we have come together as a community to fill their pantry that serves students and families in need as well as provide lunch for staff and students who drop in at the school. Um, we still need your help to ensure that a team of faithful All Saints volunteers can continue to provide lunch at Learning Works three days a week through the end of the calendar year. This need has become greater now that one of the homeboy locations has temporarily shut down and their staff and some of their students are using the Learning Works site and we need to feed them as well. So uh, what you can do is visit the All Saints website uh, allsaints-pas.org, click on the donate button, then click on one-time gift, and there you can contribute any amount to this effort. No gift is too small, no gift is too large, uh, by typing learning works under the special gift notes. You can help nourish the bodies and minds of some of the most vulnerable people in our community through your generosity. And so many thanks to Elizabeth Lashley Haynes for the incredible work she's doing coordinating this ministry. And now on to this morning's forum. Uh, every Sunday when we're in worship together, we hear excerpts from scripture. Now in some traditions, the preacher chooses the readings. In ours and in many others, the readings are assigned in advance. And this is what's known as a lectionary. And lectionaries have been around in some form for more than 1800 years. Currently the Episcopal church uses what is called the revised common lectionary. It is a three year cycle of readings each beginning on Advent 1, which is today, and each Sunday having a reading from the Hebrew scripture or the Acts of the Apostles, a psalm, a reading from one of the epistles or the book of Revelation, and finally a reading from one of the four gospels. And each of the three years highlights a different gospel reading. And you may know there's four gospels in three years, so it highlights Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John gets sort of sprinkled in. Uh, we've just finished year A, which highlights Matthew, and today begins year B, which in the revised common lectionary highlights Mark. But we're not doing year B this year. We are doing year W. You see, the one thing that all lectionaries for nearly two millennia have had in common is that the readings were primarily chosen by men, were translated by men, and centered the stories and voices of men in scripture until now. The Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney has taken on the immense task of constructing a lectionary that centers the stories and voices of women in scripture. When completed, there will be a three-year cycle, and there is already a one-year, a year W, that can be dropped in and used for a year by a congregation. Now, we're no stranger to this work because Dr. Gaffney was with us as a scholar in residence in November 2019 as she was working on the women's lectionary, and today, and for the rest of the liturgical year, we at All Saints Church will be the first congregation to use it in our weekly worship. We are deeply grateful to Dr. Gaffney for the immense work that has gone into this project, and we are thrilled to welcome her to our forum this morning and to our virtual pulpit at the 1115 service so she can be the first person to preach from this lectionary. So Dr. Gaffney, welcome back to All Saints Church. Oh, you gotta unmute. <laughs> Should be good. You're good now. No, I had a I had a pop up that wouldn't go away. I think it was from the <laughs> host. Thank you, and I'm so glad to be back, and so sorrowful that I'm back from 
my kitchen altar rather than yep. <laughs> around the table there. Uh, I want to thank you and the vestry and members of All Saints for how you have supported this project from the beginning and are supporting it even now and will prayerfully continue to support it oh, yeah. uh, when we're able to be up and around. Fantastic. Well, why don't you just kind of take us to the beginning? Where did this idea come from? Where did you get the idea for this? Well, it began with frustration from the uh, Episcopal and RCL lectionaries. I differentiate our version of the RCL uh, because we actually do include readings from the deuterocanonical texts. So when I say Episcopal and RCL, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, I was frustrated. I was preparing to preach and the lessons were terrible. And I've told this story many times and uh, I whined about it on Facebook and some of my friends said, why don't you do one? And so the idea kicked around and it was largely born out of that, but some contributing elements were uh, my own uh, doctoral work. Uh, my dissertation advisor uh, had counted up uh, women who have names preserved in the Hebrew Bible and sorted out that there are about 111 D, as I like to say. And I thought, even as a professional biblical scholar, I could not just rattle off a hundred named women in the Hebrew Bible, let alone all the women whose names are unknown. So I thought there are characters that we need to address. And some of those went into my uh, 2017 book, One Miss Midrash. And the rest of them just sort of hovered around me uh, in the great cloud of witnesses and communion of the saints and urged me to do this project. So like, where, do, like it's an immense task. Where do you begin? Well, because this is a lectionary for use in the church, we begin with the liturgical seasons mm -hmm. and then uh, with the gospel of the year, as you have already said, and I had written uh, some notes for myself based on your earlier questions, and I used the exact same words you did with John sprinkled around. Yeah. Uh, that seems to be the best verb. So I start uh, under those uh, parameters and then I want the Hebrew Bible to lead rather than be uh, subject to the uh, Christian Testament as sort of a set of proof texts. So mm -hmm. I want those characters to have their own story. So I find stories that speak to the broader themes of the liturgical season. And then I weave in Psalms second and after that, I look usually for the gospel first and then uh, the epistle last. But all of that work is done within the context of a database that I generated uh, so that I could have ready access to texts in each uh, book of scripture, in each section of scripture in which there were women and girls present. And so I used a gigantic Boolean search on the According to Biblical uh, software platform where I searched for every term that pertained to women and girls that I could find. And that generated my uh, database. Wow, so um, I, I love what you're talking about in terms of starting with the Hebrew texts. Can you talk a little bit more about how that is different than traditional lectionaries? Because I bet most people don't know um, how traditional lectionaries have been formed. Well, traditional lectionaries um, center the gospel, which is the, the treasure of the Christian tradition, but they don't just center it. They center it in such a way as to make the Hebrew Bible simply a precursor and often simply a set of predictions. Um, and I have said uh, in multiple platforms that the Hebrew Bible is a sufficient volume of scripture by itself, sufficient to reveal God, to contain words of God, sufficient to invite us into God. And so I want to let its story stand uh, because that's how I understand Jesus functioned. His scriptures were the Hebrew Bible. He read them, he was inspired by them, he taught them, he taught them in new ways, he taught them in traditional ways, uh, but he treated them as the canon of scripture in which we encounter God. 
And so I seek to do that as well. Now, you what we're going to be using is year W, which is the one year version. And you're also working on a three year version, which to me just seems like a huge task. Um, can you talk about um, the, both the process of putting together the one year version and also where are you with the three year version? All right. So the uh, three year version, years A, B, and C, as we say with the traditionally established lectionaries, uh, is in process, year A is done, year mm -hmm. W uh, is almost finished. You have like 80% of it and you'll mm -hmm. certainly get the, the rest before we get into next fall. <laughs> and so the plan was to publish those two volumes together, uh, year A, uh, so that people could see what this project looked like from the beginning, but also to give those congregations who wanted to just preach a year of women a resource in year W um, that they could use immediately. Not that they couldn't use A, but because A focuses so heavily on Matthew, um, they would be missing some of the other text. And year W draws from all of the gospels in a mix. So now you said this is gonna be available publishing. Now you're, uh, can you talk about sort of the, like when, when can people be, thinking, hey, I can buy this, and where would they buy it? And Because I know it's not ready yet. It's going to be available through Church Publishing, which is the publishing house of the Episcopal Church. Um, they have tagged me in a tweet that says it's going to be available in spring 21. Uh, and so we shall <laughs> see. People should know that book release dates uh, are like other kinds of birthings. Um, they come <laughs> when they want to. Uh, except with books, they never come early. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's great. Well, so another thing about this is you didn't just choose the readings, you translated everything. Uh, and so talk about that process. What, um, what makes your translations different than we might get in say the RCL or the Episcopal RCL? Sure. So this translation is gender expansive. And that means that when there are collections of people, uh, I expand the language for that collection so that women and girls are visible. So rather than the Israelites, uh, the women, men, and children of Israel. I do use some non-binary language for uh, humanity and for God as well. I also use uh, feminine lineages, maternal lineages. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So I would instead do um, the, the God of Rebecca's lineage, right? Or the God of Rachel's offspring, so that I would center the identity uh, in the female character. Now, because women are so often used just to give birth to significant male characters that does unfortunately uh, reinforce women as as birthing machines mm -hmm. but because this lectionary focuses on so many female characters across the board you get to see women doing much more than that a, a couple of other significant translation features are that I don't use the title Lord for God or for Jesus. Um, mm -hmm. For those who don't know, uh, Lord is a slave holding title. It's mm -hmm. a title of domination uh, and it's used for human men in the biblical text as well as for God. So I don't do that. Uh, and that gives space to use some rich creative language. And I learned this tradition from the translations of Rabbi Joel Rosenberg who translated the Siddur, the prayer book of the reconstruction Jewish uh, movement. And so some of this language we share in common and some of these I have created. So I use titles for God like the wisdom of the ages, the fount of creation, the womb of life, the fire of Sinai. Um, and so that God language is throughout. Uh, one other significant uh, thing that I do is that I use exclusively feminine pronouns for God in the Psalter and just mm -hmm. in the Psalter. So that people will have that experience of praying uh, in a feminine voice. Mm -hmm. And while there's been much conversation, including uh, with your ministry partners, about how that still is a binary structure, it's an important one for me and for some of my conversation partners and readers. 
because if we move just to gender neutral readings, what we will have done is move from explicit male readings to gender neutral, and, and we will not have had a place to hear and experience the divine uh, as feminine. So that's one of the reasons there still is uh, a binary aspect to this project. Yeah. And, and actually, I'd love to sort of dive into that a little more. One of the things that you said when you were here, which I realized is so true for me, is even when I'm in a worship situation and gender neutral uh, language is being used for God, the male image for God has been so ground into my head through a lifetime of male images of God, that even when I hear something that's gender neutral, what my consciousness is still experiencing is a male image. And it's different when there is something that is explicitly feminine used. And, and I thought, so can you talk a little about that? And how did you come to that understanding? I came to that understanding both in my pastoral ministry and in my teaching, uh, talking to people, because what I realized is that when I stopped using masculine language, I was in a context where it uh, wasn't really appropriate to use feminine language, but I also needed to be true to myself. And so what I did is what many of these services do is I just said God all the time. Right. And while that felt more true, it was not in the least bit disruptive because it did not disrupt or dislodge. And so when I said God, um, they heard he. And so they had no reason to interrogate their theology or their understandings of God. And that experience uh, helped me to realize that what, while there is value in gender inclusive and gender neutral, it's still erasure. Yeah. So, and, and part of what we talked about when you were here is there's a real challenge in meeting our understanding of gender, which right now we are, are realizing is on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, to the understanding of gender that exists at the time these texts were written, which was a binary understanding in many ways. And so can you talk about, you know, how, how have you wrestled with that in these translations uh, of recognizing that, you know, we're discovering more broadly as a society, there's always been sort of, you know, every culture has had a sense of being more than two genders, but more broadly as a society, that gender is much more complex. How have you wrestled with that? So I wrestled with it uh, on my own, and I wrestled with it in conversation uh, with you and your ministry partners. Uh, and I don't want to name names because I don't know uh, where people are in terms of uh, public identification. Yeah. Uh, but I had a very helpful conversation partner when I was with you, and they uh, really helped me to see how uh, a non-binary person uh, would appreciate uh, different language from for God than we've we've heard certainly uh, more than the uh, the he and even more than the the neutral but also of course wanted to see them represented themselves represented in God language so that the the theology the articulation that I am created in the image of God is true and reflected in the language I hear about God from my priest and pastor so uh, I took that to heart and many of these uh, titles for God that I use, as I just gave you, uh, are in fact inclusive, like Fire of Sinai. Some are explicitly feminine, like Womb of Life, but there's a range for divine language. And uh, sometimes with God, I, I'm using pronouns like they, sometimes with God, I've used uh, Z and Zir. It sort of depends on how the text is coming together. In terms of human peoples, uh, I use binary language, but I also use some collective language, uh, like children and kindred. Uh, sometimes it does make more sense to use siblings as a collective. Um, sometimes I break that open when I know the character has daughters and sons or has sisters and brothers. So I also know that my project is not where it needs to be in the eyes of some of my most marginalized readers. But it's a step and it's a bridge. And as a, as a professor, as an academic, as a scholar, one of the things you want is for people to build on your legacy, or at least good scholars. I, I don't want anyone to say, well, this project's begun, Dr. Gaffney did it, it's the last word. If 
um, if that person you know I'm thinking of decided to do a PhD in biblical studies uh, and did a whole new version of this project that was even more radically inclusive than I'm able to be because of my embodiment and my social location, uh, I would look over from glory and mm -hmm. Well, and 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 we're sort of just jumping around when I when I think about looking forward to doing this uh, lectionary and hearing these stories, one of the things I'm most hoping for and looking forward to is the conversations that come from this, uh, because that's where you know the learning is going to happen, and and the questions about what about this, um, you know, I imagine that you've had some of these conversations with your own students. Uh, oh. as you've been developing these things. Um, can you talk about some of the conversations that you've had with your students as you've developed this and where those have fed you? Certainly, I have always invited my students to explore language for God that goes beyond the language they know and beyond what they're familiar with. And I've had them read some of the Psalms that Dr. Rosenberg uh, translated. And even before I was doing this project, and I have pushed them to, uh, articulate God in terms of the narrative. So if in the narrative, God is providing for her people, then perhaps identify God as uh, the God of abundance provided manna in the wilderness, right? So look for how the text shapes the identity of God. And so it's not just about change that to a feminine word, but right. think of God more fully more creatively uh, and recognize that none of our language is adequate to the task. So we use as much of it as possible in as many different ways as possible to uh, gesture towards that which we cannot fully articulate. Another thing that, that I've seen you do, and this is, um, this is something that we've been working with here at All Saints as well, is looking at the language of darkness. Yes. Um, and, and actually, you suggested when you were here with us in November to substitute bleakness, bleakness. Uh, for darkness. Uh, you know, and so can you talk about the importance, uh, how that word, how the light and dark has been used in really abusive ways and the importance of redeeming that language and changing it? Yeah. Sometimes I use bleakness. Sometimes I use gloom. Sometimes I use shadow. Mm -hmm. Biblical texts exist in a binary world in lots of ways. And so darkness uh, is often associated um, with negativity and light is often associated with positivity. But that is in fact not a rigid binary in the biblical text. Uh, so that the place where God is, where God dwells is thick darkness. Well, that mm -hmm. gets lost when translated into a Western world that decided to codify and commodify people based on degrees of darkness. So even though darkness in the biblical text is not about people or skin or race, which did not exist in the biblical world, the way that the Western world, the Western white world consumed the biblical text meant that the language of blackness and darkness was tied to human persons human persons who were not in fact treated as human persons who were denied uh, the image of God. And so then our religious language gets laid on top of it. And we have songs like, what will make me white as snow, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I, I said in a context, I'm going to be black as coal when I go to heaven. If anything, That's I'll right. get blacker. And That's they right. Think, right? Um, and the children's song, um, I remember some song, Something like if I had a little white box, I put my Jesus on it. If I had a little black box, I put the devil in it. You know, mm -hmm. we were acculturated that way. I remember when our worship leaders changed that to a red box for the devil because they were progressive, right? But this language of black being equated with dark is really problematic when it gets spiritualized. Um, and even when a pastor or priest or preacher is not preaching racialized rhetoric intentionally, what you are continuing to do is tell black baby children um, that their blackness is not good and it's something God wants to fix. Mm. And so 
Advent uh, being in the winter when the world is darker, it's natural to talk about the coming of the light because the days get longer. But we can do that without demonizing the darkness, the nurturing cocoon in which uh, we rest and are strengthened and transformed. I mean, we can do so much with our language, but we have largely chosen not to. And some of that has to do with how we've been shaped by white Christianity. Yeah, and so like, and like you talk about like, so we're in Advent now and there, there is so much rich imagery. And one of the, one of the terms that you have for God is womb of life. Mm -hmm. um, is just, I, I, I love that. And if there's any season that we should be looking at enriching our language uh, about God, it should be Advent, which is a birth narrative. You know, it's a pregnancy and a birth narrative. So, um, you know, this, this is where we're starting for the next four weeks, and you're going to preach today uh, on Advent One texts. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what it was like to look at Advent from this perspective? Well, I have a very high Mariology. I uh, okay. hear the Blessed Virgin and uh, have had that spirituality for a while. And there is a book, and I'm not going to call the name because that might be wrong, but uh, it was the devotional on Mary that went through the pregnancy and it went through sort of every stage and every phase. And I have often thought, starting with the Feast of the Annunciation, which is March 25th, mm -hmm. imagining a nine month pregnancy that ends on December 25th, about what it's like to go through a year with Christ consciousness within you fully wow. in that way. And so that has been a devotional model that has been part of me. Um, on your website, the, uh, your staff was kind enough to use an updated picture of me uh, in the purple chasuble that mm -hmm. I would have been in if I had been with you and had been celebrating at table. And the large icon is the ever blessed Virgin Mary fully pregnant with a halo that goes around her whole body to encompass the Christ child. And so that's sort of evocative, evocative of my spirituality. And then the lower icon uh, is the empty tomb and there is a scarlet path that runs uh, from the womb to the tomb. So mm -hmm. I was kind of set up to go into Advent <laughs> thinking of it from a Marian perspective. That's great. Well, you talked a little about um, learning in terms of uh, gender and, and, and binaries and things like that. Um, what else did you learn? Were there assumptions that you had made going in that got, that got challenged? Um, were there things that surprised you? Uh, everything. <laughs> what surprised me was how much work it was because my initial plan was not to translate everything. I thought I could just do some patches. I could just update some gender things. Uh, but I am, I, I do not like the term perfectionist, but I'm very detail oriented and I have a set of expectations about myself. So that made the work bigger than I could have ever imagined. Um, Surprises, there are lots of surprises along the way. And for people who follow me or will on Facebook or Twitter, I post under hashtag women's lectionary fairly mm -hmm. regularly when mm -hmm. I come across something in translation uh, that sort of sets me back on my heels or opens up in a new way. Uh, I, but by preparing for the sermon today and for this talk, I, it's hard for me to come up with any concrete examples. So I just invite uh, our viewers and listeners today yeah. to look for those hashtags. But there's, there's something that comes up almost weekly. Well, and so bef before this, and you referenced this before, you have a, a book called Women as Midrash. And, and first of all, sort of talk a little bit about what Midrash is mm -hmm. for people who may not know. Um, but that also was a way that, you know, that's an amazing book and it introduces you to women in scripture. Um, were there, as you began this project, stories of women that you had either known before Women as Midrash or that you learned while writing that book that you were especially excited to introduce users of this lectionary to? So Midrash is a classical uh, rabbinic Jewish practice of biblical interpretation. It is rooted in knowledge of the Hebrew language. And uh, there are layers of interpretation in 
in classical rabbinic uh, Jewish interpretation. Uh, and some of those layers include filling gaps in the stories by giving characters names or explaining uh, oddities in the text. And out of that comes uh, the process of uh, rewritten Bible, which is the term that scholars are using uh, more and more that some of you may know as people telling expansive stories about the biblical texts or mm -hmm. uh, the tradition of black folk and black preaching, the sanctified imagination where you fill out a text. Uh, so, but all of those things go back to a deep understanding of the text in its uh, biblical Hebrew form. So that book uh, was indeed a, a reintroduction to characters that I wanted people to know. And so fully half of that book is an exploration of the royal women of Israel and Judah. And to go back to the beginning of our conversation, when I said there were 111 named uh, women in the Hebrew biblical text that we often don't know, uh, that includes some 25, 28 royal women. And so uh, I wanted to introduce people to them. Uh, along the way, I really developed uh, an appreciation for the character um, Ahinoam, who is um, Saul's wife. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so there, that book, uh, Woman is Midrash, does that, introduces people to characters who are on the margins, who are minoritized. Uh, in terms of the lectionary, <laughs> I guess I want to introduce everybody to everything. Uh, <laughs> and some of it is, is contextual. So mm -hmm. for a feast like the Great Vigil of Easter, we have a set of readings. We start with creation because that's the beginning of all things. Uh, but then we go through the mighty acts of God, uh, right. places where God delivers, you know, the Red Sea, uh, battles, places where getting Israel out of exile, just the, the story, but, but it focuses on the, those moments of deliverance. And we know that God delivers by women. So what I did for the uh, great vigil was I kept the church's principle of focusing on how God delivers. And I used Deborah and I used mm. Judith. And I use uh, Jehoshaphat, who people may not know, but she's the one who saved uh, the baby king when Athalia uh, killed everybody, took him into hiding, and got him on the, uh, you know, on the throne. So there are stories of places where women bring deliverance. And of course, uh, in the Exodus text, which is part of the Great Vigil, I changed the verses so that we could have the prophet Miriam dancing the people across the sea. So mm. it stays in the tradition, but it changes the characters. Yeah. So I, 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 I'm so excited about how, even using this for a year, how this is gonna challenge and change our thinking of hearing these stories centered and these voices centered. Um, if you had to sum up, and this is probably an impossible thing to ask, um, what an experience of scripture that centers women's stories and voices is from one that centers men's stories and voices is. Um, as you look at sort of the corpus of what you're putting together, um, how would you characterize the difference? What is, how are those experiences different? Let's see. Um, one of the centering women in terms of the biblical text means that we have to ask different theological questions. And uh, I want to say this without uh, infantilizing anyone, but there's some ways in which uh, theology needs to uh, evolve and grow up, if that, if that makes <laughs> sense. So if we take a, a standard line, like God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we say, well, theologically, that's about relationship, God in relationship with people and people across generations, uh, people who will be in covenant relationship with God. If we add the women, well, first, we have to teach people who the women are. Mm -hmm. But if we add the women, then we have to ask the same question, what does it mean to make the claim the God of 
Hagar, Sarah, Keturah, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah. When we put the women back on the page, or, or rather, they're already on the page, when we open the page to them and their story and let them speak, then this covenant lineage has incest between Sarah and Abraham, who are siblings. It has polygamy. It has forced impregnation of enslaved persons. It has enslavement. Um, and so we can't just easily say that God is the God of these women. We'll talk about the relationship between God, Hagar, and Sarah today in the sermon. Mm -hmm. But Rebecca, when she went into her marriage, she brought her household gods. Was she ever uh, a believer, as we might say, that's a very Christian term? Bilha Zilpa, did they understand the God of their enslavers and owners to be their God? Um, so we, this will force us to ask different questions. And since they are part of our scriptural legacy and the degree to which God is present in the text and speaks through the text is as valid for them as any other character, then what is their testimony? What will we learn about God looking through their eyes and listening to their voices? And how does that shape how we understand the stories? And this was my point about theology. Our theology is going to have to accommodate that with something other than that's the way it was. And the story is really about Abraham. Mm. Is all of that God? Uh, is that litany of things irrelevant to God as long as the covenant gets made and kept? Telling all of these stories, or at least more of these stories, means that we have to reevaluate and redevelop theology because some of our theology is simply too simple to address the complexity of the text or the complexity of the world. And what the lectionary has done, the established lectionaries, is it creates a canon, a canon within a canon. So people know the lectionary stories right. who, who go to lectionary churches. And when they come to divinity school and seminary, they realize they don't actually know the story from which that lesson was lifted. They don't know the rest of the story. They don't know the conflicting texts. Um, and so it creates an artificial bubble of, in some cases, very superficial biblical knowledge. So this project, this lectionary project is a biblical literacy project. And that's, it, it also makes me think about the ways that we, we as a society have, uh, you know, through millennia of patriarchy, um, have undercut the trust and the authority of women, and and there's something about like these these are not just any texts that we're talking about. These are sacred texts. These are texts that we say we believe uh, are inspired uh, by God and that God speaks to us through. And as we have read them, centering the men in the stories, centering the stories of men. Um, it has undercut an idea that women can be deliverers, that women can hold authority. I mean, one of the primary arguments used against the ordination of anyone who wasn't a man was Jesus's maleness. Uh, and and I, I wonder, like even right now, like, you know, you know, women are far less likely to be bishops. Women are far less likely to be rectors of churches like All Saints, large, large congregations. Um, you know, women are far less likely in our church and certainly in our society to have positions of responsibility. Uh, I wonder how a reframing of that can happen through telling these stories of the incredible authority um, of, 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 of women. And is, and I, I guess in, in some ways, it's sort of like what, this gets in sort of the bigger questions. What is what is your hope for the impact of this? You've talked about you hope that it's a stepping stone and that someone else will come and improve on it. Um, but what is your hope for the impact of this? Honestly, biblical literacy uh, yeah. is, my, is my primary hope. And out of that biblical literacy, then reforming our theology, uh, my former Lutheran students will be shocked to hear me use that as a verb because I'm famous for saying, I am not reformed, I'm Episcopal. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but but uh, 
addressing our theology. As you know, we've had conversations about the language in our prayer books and how mm -hmm. male it is. And I had a Twitter chat with some folk about uh, all of the biblical language that's available. And so I watched uh, a couple of these uh, male clergy uh, start out uh, very critical of the enterprise and then saying, oh, I didn't remember that language was in there. Oh, you know, that would go right right well in, a, in the great thanksgiving oh you know and part of it was they didn't know these passages of text they hadn't mm -hmm. seen these passages of text so if we increase our biblical literacy we can transform our language and ultimately make the church more inclusive and more hospitable and more honest uh, and give people uh, a foundation from their childhoods up about uh, what people can do without regard to gender um, and, and change the way change the way we function in the world. So uh, I guess at the very telos end of the project, it's a pinky in the brain uh, <laughs> moment for people who know that cartoon. What are we going to do? Same thing we do every day. Take over the world. Change. Yeah. The world. It re reminds me, um, Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs, who's the uh, Bishop of Indianapolis, preached an amazing sermon at the consecration of uh, Deion Johnson, the Bishop of Missouri. And she talked about, you have to tell the whole story so that you can write a new story. Yes. And, and I think about what you're doing with this lectionary is we have not, we've never told the whole story of scripture. And that's the biblical literacy piece mm -hmm. is we need to learn the whole story um, and then we can challenge and be challenged by uh, what we have always believed to be true mm -hmm. and say, well, in light of knowing the whole story, how do we need to change? You know, do what we always do, you know, take over, take over the world. You know, how do how do we need to, to change with this? Um, what has as, as you have um, particularly talked to men about this project, what has the reaction been? I have been surprised by uh, the male support I've gotten. And quite frankly, I have not gotten the negativity that I anticipated. Now, mm -hmm. there may well be rooms in which I am not present, uh, <laughs> but being a, a woman who is in the public sphere, um, you know, I get comments on social media and on my blog and people email me things. And when we were doing the prayer book conversation, uh, mm -hmm. I got some, some hateful, ignorant and humorous mail, but I haven't gotten any of that uh, in this context. Uh, so the men that I know are interested in the project, uh, committed to preach from the project, looking forward to receiving it. Um, and I'm excited about that as well. So I, you know, when, when I first th thought about preaching uh, about this, one of my first things was, oh my gosh, thank God, something new to preach from as someone who's been preaching for more than 20 years from the same lectionary. It's like, oh, this is going to be great. Um, and then I sat down because I had to preach. I'm preaching at the one o'clock service this Sunday. Um, and, you know, preaching oh, wow. is always uh, <laughs> is always a sacred trust. Say that again. I didn't know you were preaching uh, behind me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm preaching at our our, our, um, our our bilingual service, our Spanish English service. I'm preaching in Spanish, and 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 I thought, um, you know, preaching is always a sacred trust. But there was something about this. Uh, something happened, and my camera went away. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and and so what? What you know? I, um, yeah. I mean, what? And and, and I'm and I'm, I'm looking at. Well, how you know how do I preach these stories, um, wanting really to um, to to amplify the voices that are near, and also to sort of this Sunday to prepare people for the year to come. Um, what, I mean, because what I'm hearing you saying is that these aren't just about here are some stories you haven't heard, but there is a whole mindset with which we approach scripture that is different when we center these voices. What counsel would you have for me and other men preaching from this lectionary who may still be tempted to look at these perhaps newer stories from the same male dominated mindset to say, oh yeah, but it's still really about Abraham. Right. Um, and that is 
let the text lead you. Don't start with the presumption that you're going to preach a the classical Christmas, Easter, or First Advent uh, sermon simply by swapping out a character or changing pronouns. Um, let the text lead you to where it's going, and perhaps think about the biblical text as a palimpsest. Uh, a palimpsest is a ancient manuscript, handwritten manuscript, biblical manuscript. And when you look closely, there's something underneath the letters on it, and that is a whole nother manuscript. So it was uh, washing and reusing papyrus and sometimes multiple stories on the same sheet. So mm -hmm. think about the biblical text in that way. You may tell a completely different story that gets you to a completely different point. And it may be uncomfortable, as with the example I gave about the patriarchs and the matriarchs. Um, you're, you can't preach the same way because the stories of women and girls and other marginalized persons in scripture are not the same as the stories of the heroes uh, of the text. And whether one is focusing on women or not, or using a women's lectionary or not, I think far too few preachers have uh, the habit, the habitus of preaching uh, the people on the bottom of the narrative, right? Preaching about Israel and when they were under occupation, but not preaching about the Canaanites under Israelite occupation. So this needs to be part of a broader practice of reading the text at the margins and asking what is God doing there and who is God to that person, that community? And does that line up with the confessions I make about God? This one of our lines of our mission statement is, you know, we would say first line, we are, we're an Episcopal church walking with a revolutionary Jesus. And what you're talking about is about a Jesus who is a revolutionary. And, you know, since Theodosius and Constantine, when church became empire and empire became church, um, we have used that narrative, uh, you know, selectively to, you know, G with Jesus as the victor. And it's where we got things like the Crusades and it's where we get, you know, the church of today. And, you know, it feels like there's an invitation in looking at the stories of women and hearing the voices of women to do what you're talking about, to say, um, you know, the whole point of, of the incarnation, I think about the Philippians reading that we have today, um, you know, Christ who did not see equality with God as something to be grasped, um, sees, but uh, emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being form, born in human likeness, and then being found in human form, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, is to say, what does it look like to read from the margins? Um, what would that mean for us as the church, which has pretty much tried to, you know, through our own existence, figure out, you know, how can we be the most successful? How can we get to the top of the heap uh, to say that, no, actually the church's place is, you know, as, as Greg Boyle likes to say, we stand, you know, with those on the margins until the margins disappear under our feet. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think a church what do you think the church would have been like? And this is just an impossible question. Uh, if we had been reading these stories all along, how might we be different? I think it's about more than reading mm -hmm. the stories, but I think we would have a broader understanding of the sacred story writ large. And I think it would be less hierarchical. I mm -hmm. remember reading uh, a New Testament scholar talking about how we introduce students to the study of the New Testament. And she made an argument for beginning with that uh, final chapter of Romans, where Paul is doing salutations to all of the people who are doing the work of the church on the ground. And what, a third of them are women. Uh, including a, a woman, Junia, who he considers chief among the apostles. Uh, that has been overwritten and mistranslated, and there's some Bibles you can't even find that in. Mm. But if we entered the Christian story with, 
the explosion of the church and all hands on deck and all kinds of hands, mm -hmm. that would be very different than um, the sort of promised Messiah from a specific lineage who has the right ancestors, and that's a, a male focused thing aligned with monarchy, which is itself aspirational empire. I mean, it's just a very different entry into the story. So it's it would form the church differently, and you're right, nobody could speculate how, but it would be uh, different. Uh, you, um, you've talked about one of your hopes for this is biblical literacy. Um, and that's something that I, I think is not at, shall we say, a high ebb in the church right now. We had we had an amazing guest, I guess it was about a year ago, we were together, um, Ani Zonenfeld, who's the who's founded an organization called Muslims for Progressive Values. And one of the things that Ani is amazing at doing is calling out uh, conservative male clerics in her tradition for how they are absolutely mischaracterizing uh, the Quran, their sacred scripture. And she's able to say, that's not in the Quran, or that's not what it says. But in order to do that, you have to really know the scripture in order to do that. Can you talk about what you are seeing in terms of biblical literacy and why you think it's important? Sure. I, I want to go back to uh, discussion of the Quran and its tradition. Um, mm -hmm. There is uh, this uh, the word ikra, which means read in Arabic, is like the this primary commandment that that you be literate in your sacred text, and that that word has been with me for a long time. So when now I've just lost the thread of the. <laughs> of uh, what, why is why is biblical literacy important? Why why is it important? It ought to be important so that we can know our stories and have these stories as resources to navigate this world uh, as a way deeper into the heart of God as we walk uh, this journey together. But it is also the case that our sacred stories are used violently, horribly. Uh, and I find that Christians are often not equipped, pastors, uh, even those in the, in the public square to speak back against some of these really harmful theologies that are being lifted out of the biblical text. And if we tell the truth, sometimes it's not distortions or misinterpretations or mistranslations, but it's you know trying to literally apply Iron Age ethics to mm -hmm. a digital world. Uh, and there are things we don't do to people anymore, like stone them. So uh, as we wrestle with those texts, we have to wrestle with them in their uh, context of production and our own context of reading and interpretation. And part of biblical literacy is knowing the context. Look, if you're a constitutional scholar in this country, you don't just have the constitution memorized. You have studied volumes of American and French thinkers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is this notion that you can be biblically literate because you can uh, recite texts, but uh, know nothing about uh, the so uh, sociology or cultural anthropology. Um, and one of the examples I use in my class at the very beginning is as we talk about families, that what the word family means in the Hebrew Bible is not uh, two people, even heteronormative, and their offspring. That's not a recognizable social unit. What we call a nuclear family did not exist in that world. And the word family just does not apply to that, right? So that when you take a text about family in the Hebrew Bible and make it about a, an aspirational uh, nuclear family, you're doing something that the biblical text simply doesn't do. And it's because people are not literate in the culture and context to support and strengthen their uh, interpretive work. So and this is something I'm hoping that that will happen here at All Saints. And you know, because we're, you know we're in COVID time and everything is online, it means All Saints can be around the world. Anyone can join in. 
um, is really getting some work done on some Bible studies as we go through these tests. I know it's something that Susan Russell is really interested in working on and, and, and others of us are too. And, and so you're going to be hearing about that of opportunities as we look at some of these texts, which for many of us will be new. Um, and certainly with translations that will be different is a chance for us to be in conversation about them, to be in conversation uh, with them and to really look at this and say, well, what does, you know, how does this change uh, how I have understood, how I've understood scripture? How does this change how uh, I am understanding God? Um, you, uh, do you have any resources that you would recommend? Uh, Womanist Midrash obviously being a good one. Uh, but, uh, and like, by the way, you recommended that Accordance Bible software, which is just one of the best things I ever bought. It's amazing. Oh. Uh, it is, like, I use it all the time. Um, are there other resources that you would recommend uh, for this work? If individuals or groups or congregations wanted to do this work of uh, biblical literacy of saying, how do we dive into this more? Sure. Uh, one of the very good tools for reading uh, the Hebrew Bible, the First Testament, is uh, the Jewish Publication Society uh, Jewish Study Bible, uh, and that and that is what it says it is. It's it's a study Bible, and it's important for Christians to read the Hebrew Bible in its own context and understand what those narratives meant in that context, in order to understand what is happening when Jesus takes them interprets them further, or in some cases, uh, inverse them by saying, you have read, you have seen it written, but I say unto you. Um, and so Jesus, and even Paul, whose exegesis is, is not linear by any means, are operating with a knowledge of the text and culture that Christian readers don't have necessarily. And so I highly recommend that. And then there's a companion, which is the Jewish annotated New Testament, which is Jewish scholars uh, reading and commenting on the New Testament to provide some uh, contextualization. And both of those are, are invaluable as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we're gonna wrap up in a few minutes. We can go a few minutes over because um, uh, Children's Chapel is gonna be a little shorter today. Um, and, but we also have people who are gonna be gathering in our meditative chapel. Um, one of the things that you talked about in um, womanist midrash is that it's that word womanist um and that's a word i wasn't familiar with that word until i read that book um can you talk about what it means to look at scripture through a womanist lens and also what is the difference between a feminist perspective and a womanist perspective sure so womanism is most simply the feminism of black women but womanism is a richer, deeper, thicker, wider feminism. Uh, as Alice Walker uh, says, uh, womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender. Hmm. Womanism is a holistic worldview. It's not just uh, a religious or theological perspective. It's a holistic worldview. And it is foundationally intersectional, a word that is misused and misunderstood. Intersectional is about looking at the impacts of multi-layered, uh, interwoven, oppressive structures, not having multiple identities, but the impacts that result from the oppressive structures uh, that target those multiple identities. So womanism looks at uh, what happens to black women, children, our families and communities. And that means we're invested in the well-being of the, the whole community, the nation, the world, the earth, and all of her ecosystems because black women are connected by blood and love to peoples of other races and ethnicities. So that's part of it being holistic. Whereas uh, Western feminism, particularly white feminisms, have often been one dimensional about gaining access, gaining power, getting a seat at the table, rather than asking why is there a table with such limited access or even deconstructing the table. Hmm. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. If, you, if people wanted to read more about this, who would you recommend uh, that we read? Well, there's uh, what? 40 years of womanist scholarship and the lists, it's the lists are long. So 
uh, founding mothers like Katie Geneva Cannon, um, I would add Emily Towns. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of uh, contemporary voices like Carrie Day. Um, there, there's just so so much and so many. Monica Coleman. Uh, mm, right. Uh, there's woman in scholarship. Uh, Stephanie Crumpton in pastoral care, in theology, uh, ethics, uh, biblical studies. Uh, it's just a, it's a rich worldview available to be discovered. Mm. We're, you know, we, we got a few more minutes. I would just love to sort of open this up to you. Are, you know, what is, what, what is on your heart about this project, particularly because it's debuting in a really challenging time in our life. We're in the middle of a pandemic that is getting worse. We're, you know, we just finished a challenging election season that we hope is over. Um, and, you know, this, this, this is, feels like an inflection point right now for the church and for society. Um, and at this moment, All Saints Church is gonna be spending a year um, listening to and studying these stories. Um, what comes to your heart? What are your hopes? Um, what, what are your feelings right now? I think because we're still in the midst of the pandemic um, and it's still the semester and the Society of Biblical Literature is an online conference that's <laughs> running for 10 days, uh, or maybe 12 days. Somebody thought that was a good idea. Uh, what I'm feeling right now is tired. Mm. <laughs> um, and and uh, knowing that I've got to preach it a little while. Mm -hmm. So that, so listening to my body and being where I am in terms of the year, I am, I'm not sure how to tap into this with you all. I know we will always remain in touch, but I'm really interested in seeing what this journey looks like, um, what feedback you get, what it's, what's it like for you uh, as, as a preacher using this text, what it's gonna be like uh, for uh, Reverend Susan Russell or any of the other staff that preach. Uh, in fact, uh, next week, uh, I want to be. I want to be in the room. I want to be in the panelist room, uh, mm -hmm. so I can greet the preacher and be introduced. And I want to hear how the next preacher is going to preach from uh, the lectionary. So I'm really interested uh, in feedback. I should also say about the publication schedule. Once this, these two years, which make up the first volume, uh, go to press unless they decide to break them up and do them in four, they're still talking about that. Mm -hmm. I will have to move off the project and go back to Womanist Midrash because I'm doing a second volume focusing on women and the prophets. I will do that volume and then I will come back and do years B and C. So it's, a, it's gonna be a lengthy haul mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll be able to see each other again. And <laughs> you all will be able to uh, help me find uh, writing space and away space uh, so these things can get done. Well, and and next week we have as our both our forum guest and as our preacher, uh, Bishop Gene Robinson. And uh, talking to to Bishop Robinson about this and Gene about this, he's 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 thrilled to be able to to tackle this and and to work with this. So certainly having you uh, as a panelist and able to uh, to greet him. And I'm I'm fascinated to sort of like I'll be interested to know how I how I work with this. We're planning a a Lent this this uh, this coming year, where we will only have women preaching during Lent, uh, because one of the things that that happens just as we have uh, taken the voices and stories of women in Scripture and sidelined them, so we have also done with our pulpits. Uh, we did this several years ago. We had during the season of Epiphany. Uh, we called it a season of wisdom and revelation. And we had uh, amazing preachers like uh, Kelly Brown Douglas and Tracy Blackman and Brunel Anderson um, and you know, Lisa Sharon Harper and others and you know, Anne Rett Vera from our own congregation uh, uh, preaching. And so we're going to be doing that again this Lent. We're going to have, um, and so if there's women that you would recommend, we've got so many extraordinary preachers, both at All Saints Church and, and, and around the country that we're just uh, thrilled. And again, there's not much that's good about this pandemic, but you know, one of the things is, is anyone can preach as long as they can sit in front uh, of a computer with, uh, with, with internet access. Um, 
and so I'm just getting a, just getting to Keith is Keith is telling me to uh, to wrap this up. So uh, just deeply, deeply grateful for the work that you have done on this. Um, I am looking forward to being changed, and and that is that's a huge gift. Um, and I'm I'm hoping that as a congregation um, and as a church, we can listen in different ways. Um, and we can become more biblically literate, uh, and, and that we can maybe imagine a new story for ourselves in ways that we hadn't before. So, uh, Dr. Gaffney, thank you so much for all the work that you've done on this. We're going to let you take a break, uh, before you have to preach. Um, and any final words for us? No, thank you all, uh, who are listening and watching. And I appreciate all of you who have supported this project. Uh, along the way. Thank you. Absolutely.